Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Culture Report. I'm Jamal Simon. I'm DeMarco Randall. And I'm Antonia Villas. And we got a lot of stuff for you today. A lot, a lot of special projects we've been working on, a lot of stories, a lot yeah, of fun it's things. It's exciting. It's Hispanic Heritage Month. It is. Antonia's been hard at work. Oh, yeah. Repping. Um, <laughs> yeah, so before we get to all that, we have a couple of head headlines to get to, so let's hop in that first. So first, right now, fears of an all-out regional war in the Middle East are heightening as airstrikes pick up between Israel and Iran and factions the United States deems Iranian-backed terrorist groups. Just this week, Iran launched its largest ever attack on Israel. The country fired 200 missiles, most of which were taken down by Israel, the U.S., and other allies. Iran says it's not looking for a wider war, but Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is vowing to retaliate. Iran says the attack was in response to several Israeli attacks on Lebanon in recent weeks, attacks responsible for killing at least seven high-ranking Hezbollah commanders, including Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah. Now, this new conflict comes as Israel approaches the one-year mark in its war against Hamas, and it doesn't seem to be letting up. This week, Israeli strikes on Gaza killed at least 90 people. A member of the Gaza Civil Defense says the strikes began in an area where hundreds of displaced people were taking shelter. And next, we also are going to be touching on the vice presidential debate. But first, we have this little spinning wheel here I that we told you guys we would bring out real quick. Just that we have like different topics on here, 10 different yeah. topics. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to discuss how voters feel about these topics, yeah, how we like feel what, about them. Yeah, what we're seeing, what we're seeing in conversations, the, on social media. The impact it could have on the election. So who wants to do the honors? DeMarco. I would love Go to. Go ahead. Okay. Spin the wheel of issues. <sighs> Spin off. Ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> Where are we at? We're at unemployment. unemployment. Okay. Well, unemployment can be something that a lot of Americans truly feel like is a big issue. Yeah. However, I feel like what we talked about in the last episode and previously is that those numbers are not really as high as they might be made out to be. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking maybe voters want a more stable work environment or a more affor affordable job yeah and i feel like it just goes to i mean well one like this topic could sway an election for sure mm -hmm. but i feel like a lot of people are misinformed and they're just going with what they think totally is going on and like that's what we learned if you guys want to take a look at our last episode we had some political experts in here they were great but we learned that things aren't nearly as bad as people are making it out to seem so i would definitely make sure to go ahead and do your research figure out what's going on before you cast your vote absolutely kind of insane the misinformation that's yeah and i will say going hand in hand with the whole misinformation thing we're seeing how a lot of claims about immigration and people who might not be documented um at least i've seen on social media people kind of making those connections without any foundation without any base um and i think that's really dangerous and i i personally have been seeing that a lot on my social media mm -hmm. and with conversations um among friends or family members um i think that there's a, a disconnect between uh what the influx of people who are coming into this country is and whatever rates of unemployment that we're seeing or anything that has to do with the economy um something that our political experts that we featured kind of really honed in on is breaking those uh, misconceptions down. And so I really encourage everyone to kind of uh, tap into that, do your own research because uh, yeah, like I said, hand in hand with the topic of unemployment has been misinformation and misinformed and baseless claims about uh, immigrants of any status um, yeah. and the economy, so. Awesome, and speaking of misinformation, ooh, this week the two vice presidential candidates went uh, Republican Senator J.D. Vance and Democratic Governor Tim Walz squared off on the debate stage with a little more than a month left until the election. Yeah, and our Verify team tracked the claims made by each candidate, fact-checking which were true and false. And early in the debate, moderators asked about climate change, pointing to the recent destruction by Hurricane Helene. Vance focused his answer on the importance of energy production in the U.S., You'd want to produce as much energy as possible in the United States of America because we're the cleanest economy in the entire world. Now, 
That claim is false. The U.S. does not have the cleanest economy in the world. Several agencies have measured this by calculating the amount of carbon emissions each country generates and comparing it to their, their economic production. By those metrics, the U.S. is cleaner than some other large economies, such as China and Canada, but quote-unquote dirtier than some others, like much of Western Europe. Walsh responded by saying Democrats have passed policies addressing climate change while also overseeing an increase in energy supply. We are producing more natural gas and more oil at any time than we ever have. That claim is true. Data from the U.S. Energy Information Administration shows crude oil production is at an all-time high, increasing every year since 2021 after a brief drop-off due to the pandemic. The data also shows that natural gas production in America has never been higher rising every year since 2016. You can also head to our website at 9news.com for more fact checks from the debate. And a new NBC Telemundo national poll shows that the Democrats' lead with Latino voters is shrinking. So the poll shows support for Kamala Harris is at 54% compared to Trump's 40%. While Harris's support is an improvement from when President Biden was on the ticket, it's still the lowest support for the Democratic candidates in the last four elections. So driving the decline was young Latino men without college degrees. Another key takeaway was the Latinos' changing attitude on immigration. 35% of people polled say immigration hurts more than it helps. That's the highest it's been since 2006. And for those of you living in Colorado, ballots for this upcoming election will be sent out next Friday, October 11th, and you'll have two weeks to return them by mail. The deadline to mail these in is October 28th, and if you miss it, you'll need to drop it in a drop box or vote in person. Ballots are due by 7 p.m. on Election Day, which is November 5th. And you can find information about all things voting in English and Spanish on our website, 9news.com. And Special Olympics Colorado serves over 23,000 athletes across the state of Colorado. For the past 55 years, the organization has offered services for individuals with intellectual disabilities. Just earlier this month, the Denver Broncos and United partnered with Special Olympics Colorado to provide a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So often, people with disabilities, they're underestimated, they're left out, and today really is about forming friendships, and I always say I love that sport is such a good unifier. Well, Special Olympics is all about opportunity, around making sure everyone knows that the incredible ability that they have inside of them always. You know, Special Olympic athletes, uh, there's something special about them. You know, I grew up, you know, obviously around Special Olympics and everything like that, so to me, you know, I, I've been the high school volunteer on their team, so to, you know, be here, it's uh, almost surreal to, you know, have them come up and just say, hey, uh, and I think the greatest thing you can do is be around Special Olympic athletes, I think. They, you know, just send such a positive message about sports. And so to, you know, be able to have that and share it with, you know, the guys on the team is really special. Oh, it was so much fun. I've been having a blast just seeing all these kids play and just, and, and, and just seeing all these special Olympics get to play with the Broncos. It's just, it's a blast. And any time a professional football player is out here taking time out of their incredibly busy schedules to train our athletes, to work with them, to cheer them on, to celebrate their athleticism. It is a great day all around and really encourages that love of sport and especially football. You know, that's what I'm doing this year, kind of uh, tackling inclusion, which is pretty special to me. But just overall, you know, I love, you know, Special Olympics and Special Olympics Colorado and, you know, thankful to, you know, be able to have events like this. Thank you for coming out here and just just go out there and just play hard and just kick the butts off. They, they deserve every opportunity uh, that they have received and, and they're amazing leaders within their community uh, and really across the world, showing people the phenomenal abilities of people with intellectual disabilities. Everyone can play them at any level and so to be able to have this and you know have united teams like this uh, through all ages, you know, we had kindergarten through high school and so to be able to have that and be able to share a field, it, it's really special. You heard Alex Singleton say he grew up around Special Olympics. His sister has Down syndrome, which is, which is in part why he has been involved with the organization for so long. Just seeing the joy on all of their faces was so much fun. But what, what do y'all think the importance of having like these athletes and these spaces for those people to have the opportunity to compete and to get those same experiences as maybe an able-bodied person? Yeah, I feel like it's so it's encouraging, if anything. I feel like whenever you have any sort of disability or anything that's different, I feel like it's so 
easy for you to think like, okay, well, I don't see anybody like me doing that or whatever. So clearly it's not for me. So seeing these people who are able-bodied being like, oh no, if I can do it, you can do it too. Especially for somebody that you look up to. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, then why not? Yeah, Why totally. can't I? You know, it's kind of like, especially someone that you look up to. It's like how your parents could tell you something and you're like, whatever. And then you hear from like somebody else, like a different adult and you're like, Actually, you're right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. To have, like you said, to have someone you look up to and you admire in that specific realm too, come in and hold your hand and be like, you're actually doing a really great job. Like yeah. that's that's really uplifting. And I think that these spaces are absolutely necessary beyond sports. Yeah. Um, so I'm really glad. Thank you for doing that story, Marco. I'm really yeah, glad that you fun. went out there and talked to those people. It was really fun. And just the sad thing is Alex Singleton just got hurt this past weekend. So he tore his ACL. He's going to be out for the rest of the season. Ooh. But I guarantee you that he's not going to stop with his community work. And, and like I said, his sister has Down syndrome. So Special Olympics and interacting with people with with disabilities is nothing new to him. And I feel like it should be a lot more nor normalized and something that people should just go out and do and make those friendships just because those people are amazing and they're awesome and they have their own unique stories that they can share and give such a different perspective on life. Yeah, thank you so much thank for you doing so that much. story. You ate that. And I'm glad that group is getting the support and attention that it deserves. So yeah. thank you to Marco. Of course. So right now, people in Denver are getting the first opportunity to see an all new musical about growing up and growing old. It's called Kimberly Akimbo. I sat down with the cast and creators of the Tony Award winning musical as they launched their first ever national tour right here in Denver. Here's a preview of what you can expect. I asked a friend how his new niece was and he said, oh, she's amazing. She's this old woman trapped in a baby's body. And I thought, well, that's a weird thing to say. Um, but I thought, oh, that's also really theatrical. And if I made it a teenager instead of a baby, there's a play there. Kimberly Akimbo is a coming of age story about a 16 year old girl plagued by an old lady um, who is dealing with a dysfunctional family, moving to a new town, making friends, dealing with lots of challenges, but she's super hopeful and adventurous and she goes on a roller coaster ride. She finds a friend in Seth who just accepts her for who, for who she is and, and vice versa. I'm gonna start with the K first because that's one of the hardest letters. Oh. He's a wordsmith. He's, um, he's just kind of, he loves Dungeons and Dragons. He, he speaks Elvish. He's just kind of an oddball. And so in so many ways he's taught me to like, lean into the things that make me, me. I have to say, writing this show was one of the most joyful experiences I've ever had. Musicals are really, really hard, especially when there are lots of people involved, um, just because collaboration is hard. But the way that we work together, we have the same mindset. Whenever one of us pitches an idea, even if it doesn't feel quite right, we don't shut it down. And I also wanted to create a really great part for an older actress. Um, because there aren't that many of them. It's not like a glamorous leading lady role, but it's so rich and full and so well written. And playing with young people is, is really fun. And this is like, I get to be a child, I mean a 16 year old, but um, to have that energy is really fun. You know, it could be really easy for me to feel like nervous and tense working with someone who's had such an extensive resume, but she makes me so feel old. like we're peers in a way that is really, really inspiring and like, and just how it should be. You know, I see this character that you invented, a woman who looks 70, but it's 16, and she knows she's gonna die really soon, and she makes a decision that she's gonna really live until she dies. I mean, we don't all have a genetic disorder, of course, but we all have things that all, all have challenges in our lives, and we all have, you know, things that get us down, things that make us feel like outsiders. And I think having her go through these things on stage and seeing how she navigates it all is, is a great lesson for everyone on how to appreciate life. That was... So sweet. So sweet, <laughs> so much. I'm telling you, Kara Lee is such an icon. And by the way, Kara Lee loves you. Oh, well, <laughs> no. she is very, she's very sweet. She was so much fun to talk to. And like, she was just talking about how excited she was for this role because of course, as you get older, you're gonna be cast as older people. And as you get old, it's like those roles are like kind of less and less fun. And yeah. it kind of makes me mad to think like, oh, you can commit your entire career 
to this, and then all of a sudden you don't get to have fun anymore. So the fact that David Lindsay Abair was able to create such a fun role where she was able to become a 16-year-old was like, it was just so amazing to see. And I feel like I would love to see more older people in those roles. Absolutely, me too. And I think what he said is so true. Like we see in the, like in any, performances, music, um, any any sort of performance, as you get older, especially with women, those roles do kind mm -hmm. of get less and less in number. So seeing this opportunity for her, and like you said, it's not, she's not, there's no limits. She can be herself. She can like go beyond the restraints that are often put for um, women and women in, who are playing certain roles. So I love to see that. I would love to see that um, play. And real quick, quick shout out to um, Janine Tesori who composed the musical. She is the most prolific theatrical composer in history. Well, Period. female theatrical composer in history. Period. We kind of that. insane, kind of crazy. She was so sweet. She was so kind. And shout out to her, icon, legend. Shout out. That's such a cool piece. Yeah. Thank you. You ate that. I did. Nom, nom, nom. <laughs> Okay, switching gears now, it's Hispanic Heritage Month, and to celebrate, editor Gonzalo Edoya and I wanted to do a little deep dive into corn, something that's part of many Latin cultures, including my own and that of Mexico. Corn is at the center of many things, like food and art, but behind these contemporary celebrations of corn is a rich cultural history that dates back thousands of years. As soon as the very first rays of sunlight begin to illuminate the cornfields of Colorado, so does the ancient ritual of transforming those grains into tortillas. Siempre empezamos cinco o seis de la mañana aquí con este, las órdenes de las tortillas de maíz. Carlos Santana Soto was raised in the Tortilleria Las Dos Americas, wanting to follow in the footsteps of his mother, Liliana Soto, who followed her father's footsteps. The business was born after her parents migrated to Colorado from Durango, Mexico. La primera tortillería comenzó en Longmont. Eh, era un sueño de mi papá, siempre poner un negocio, y él emprendió la tortillería, y luego seguimos acá con la tortillería en Commerce City, y aquí ya tenemos 24 años. Liliana's family wanted their business to honor their hometown back in Mexico even while being a little further away from it. Ellos querían algo tradicional, con su maíz fresco, molido, esos olores que despiertan la tortillería cuando estás ahí en, en, en México. Thanks to customs that have been maintained through generations, to honor their town is to honor corn. El maíz está desde el principio, y aquí estamos para seguir ese legado, para continuar Con, con esa tradición mexicana. It's a tradition that started thousands and thousands of years ago in the Gulf Coast of Mexico with the Olmecs. Ellos fueron la primera cultura hace casi 10.000 años que cultivaron, que pudieron hacer como un ciclo de agricultura sustentable. The discovery of corn was the root of essential pillars for the civilization. Si uno sabe de dónde viene la comida, Tiene mucho más tiempo libre. De, de, de momento vemos planes urbanos, pirámides, vemos una explosión de, de arte. Corn became something sacred, part of ancient theories about the universe's origin and evolution. It was even a symbol of importance. Los que nosotros presumimos son los líderes de la, de la comunidad tienen en su eh, en su cara como un espacio en ese espacio sale una forma que es que simboliza el maíz a lo largo de lo del tiempo vemos que los ajaos maya los eh, gobernantes también tienen una joya una prenda que lleva en el frente que es eh, una versión abstracta de esa planta de maíz just as this iconography was spread between prehistoric communities, we see this continue into the present. Se están viendo los muralistas, uh, la iconografía, el arte de los antepasados y quieren mostrar la importancia todavía del maíz. Thanks to exchanging with Mesoamerican groups, corn was introduced to what is now the southwest of the United States around 2000 BC. It gradually began to influence traditions and eventually became a crucial part of native cultures. 
en esta zona lo que los que estaban produciendo mucho maíz es, se llaman los Jojocam y también los Puebloans. En su iconografía, que por cierto también en sus murales, pintan la importancia y hay depicciones de, de maíz. This artistic ode to corn is also found in contemporary murals, some of which remain in Colorado thanks to community activism during the civil rights movement. Los jóvenes querían tener acceso a su historia. Sabían que ten, tenían sus raíces con los indígenas de acá, pero no tenían acceso a esta historia. Entonces, durante el movimiento, muralistas empiezan a pintar su historia en la comunidad. Be it through art or food, paying homage to corn allows for a connection with the past. Tengo muchos clientes que, de hecho, ellos vienen y dicen, ¿sabe qué? El, vivir, el venir aquí es volver a revivir. A muchos, uh, desafortunadamente, no pueden regresar todavía a sus países. Y el, el venir aquí y sentarse a comerse una tortilla, una gordita, es recordar esos tiempos. Queremos continuar con esa tradición mexicana, con, no nomás con los mexicanos, pero con, con, con todos los hispanos. Now you can find a Spanish version of this video, as well as an article in English and in Spanish on 9news.com. This was so, so fun to shoot, and I loved meeting everyone involved. It was just like, Literally the project of my dreams. I was wondering, I was like, I, how did this even pop into your head? I'm just like... Well, as I'm sure you know, like, I, I pitched this idea, because I was thinking, like, in my... I'm from Colombia, I grew up there, and so many of our really cultural, traditional foods are centered around corn, like arepas, empanadas, corn itself. We eat it with our frijoles, our arroz. Um, and, and so I was just like, wouldn't it be cool to just kind of like ask some histor some experts, historians as to why that is, like why? Because it's not just in Colombia, it's in Mexico, it's yeah. in Venezuela, so many other places. Um, and so, and we, on we don't only see it in food, we see it in art. And so I was just like, last year, late last year, I was like, I, I kind of want to just do a little deep dive to learn and learn I did. Yeah, <laughs> I would say my favorite part of the piece is seeing all those different arts, like paintings, the different sculptures and like, I just thought it was so cool to see that stuff. I'm a sucker for like street art and, you know, mm -hmm. paintings and whatnot, so. Yeah, totally. I think when people represent their culture in that way, it sticks. And it also has levels of communicating that talking might not. And so where people, somebody might be driving by or they go to a museum and they see something like that, they really can get a sense of what that culture is and the importance of something that might be so normal. Absolutely. And you yeah. didn't only learn, you also taught. So, Professor, <laughs> thank you. Professor. This is only just an overview. Like, the historical context is way more layered. Um, there are so many things that obviously you can't capture in a five minute video. Um, but hopefully, this little overview um, teaches people something and invites them to maybe do their own research because it's some really beautiful, rich history there. Yeah. So. Anyway, to keep the Hispanic Heritage Month celebration going, we wanted to highlight the cultural diversity of Nine News and learn more about the Hispanic folks that make this place what it is beyond just who you see on TV. One word that would describe my heritage, I'd say would be warmth. I would say tenacious. One word, multifaceted. I'm just gonna go ahead, I'm gonna say family. Resiliencia. Historical. Identity. Pride. Spanish is my first language, so I kind of always had it in me from day one, but as the years wore on, I kind of grew more of a sense of pride in it, so um, proud would be the word that comes to mind. Estoy muy orgullosa de mi herencia hispana uh, por la fortaleza que tenemos, que nos inculcaron. Something that we are born with and something that we uh, carry with ourselves every day. I feel the way that I act and the way that I am is partially because of my heritage. We are a blend of these beautiful subcultures within this huge culture. And for me, it's important that we take pride in who we are, who, where our blood comes from. I look back at what my ancestors had to endure with 
trying to acclimate to a sudden influx of an Anglo culture that surrounded them when they were here already for a few hundred years and what they had to do to survive and send uh, their kids to school and put food on the table. And I'm here because of them. And that makes me very proud. Just looking at the resilience we've had over thousands of years. I think with my family, it, it gives me pride because they have gone through so much and have seen so much success because they have worked so hard. Having tenacity and being sure that you are courageous and brave and, uh, you know, always trying your hardest and known for our work ethics. No importa el trabajo que tengas, si lo haces de la mejor manera y pones el extra, siempre es un orgullo. So whenever we get guests coming in from different groups and organizations and businesses, um, they feel really welcome when not only do they have a welcome face, but someone that understands their culture and their language. I'm a first generation American and you know my parents came to this country and um, it's just, you know, I feel like it's, you know, something that, you know, I need to keep on, you know, teaching to my nieces and nephews and, you know, to people around me. You know, our abuelitas tell the story that passed down to our mothers and our fathers, and then our mothers and fathers pass it down to us, and it's our responsibility to pass it down. 39 News, I try to tell stories of people that are of color, and that it includes the Hispanic community the black community, the Japanese American community. I try to seek out individuals when I can who come from different backgrounds because that is what I wanted to see when I was a little girl and watching the news. Now with the stories, it makes it much more special and it's something that I really enjoy and I am very lucky to be able to do that here. I feel so privileged that I'm in a position where I can use my position to amplify the story of my ancestors. <laughs> that was just really good. Oh my God, that was so amazing. That Antonia, so you awesome. ate that. Not me. That was all them. Um, that was so amazing. Y'all should have seen her behind the scenes. My girl was running from her up in this room. She said, Come I on. Just, I love that we got to speak with people who, because it's, tr I love highlighting our reporters who people see and are front facing, but there's so many other people who are behind the scenes who really make this place what it is and make things, make the wheel go round, you know? And, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm glad that we got to hear from them and um, learn a little bit about them and what their heritage means to them. And so it was, it was really cool to be part of that. I think the most interesting part of this and maybe about this conversation is that, yes, like we might be from the same like cultural or background, but I guarantee you no one's experience is the same from the other. Totally. Mm -hmm. But there's so many underlying commonalities and different layers that everybody can relate to from those cultures. Yes. But just hearing like different ways, different, different ways of growing up and how they express their culture and their work I, I see it every day, and it's so cool to see a piece like that. Same. Yeah. Well, thank you. Of course. It's and beautiful. Just to say, something that really resonated with me when we were like doing those interviews was Jeremy Haholo, and he was like, "Well, his family has been here since before America was even America, mm -hmm. yeah. and the fact that they were able to preserve the language, preserve the recipes, preserve the culture, like." I can't even imagine what that's like, like that ha like resilient. Totally. Yeah. It's insane. And by the way, Jeremy has done so many stories about his heritage. He's even put his grandma on air. So I encourage everyone to look up his stuff. Um, I know Jalisa Irizari, who also appears here, has also done stories that focus on the Hispanic community. So yeah, I just really, really encourage people to read those stories, uh, read about this community, get inspired, because we're, we're a special group. Yeah. And before we wrap up, just not to put you on the spot, but what's one word that would oh my God, represent no. how you feel about your Hispanic heritage? Um, I initially, when I wanted to ask them that question, I thought maybe I would say family too, just because to me, everything that encompasses my heritage um, is around people and the people closest to me are my family. So what about you? This guy? You? <laughs> I'd say the word that came to my mind is powerful. Aww. And I think that it's, hand in hand with everything, you know, you can in interpret it in any way. So I'll leave it open for interpretation. I oh. love that. Thank you, well, thank <laughs> well, you guys for beautiful. sharing. And thank you guys for joining this week's Culture Report. We'll be back to continue the conversation right here on 9 News Plus and 9news.com.